Okay, we are live. We are live, mate. It's episode what? two of what? the Becoming 1% Better podcast. How are you doing, mate? Good. Wordy, wordy name. Wordy, wordy name. I actually haven't even checked if that name is available. I have checked lots of names, but not the edition of Becoming 1% Better. Episode two, potentially the last episode due to copyright. Reasons. Yeah, but we will see Good. how we get on. We'll see how we get on. Um, dude. One percent better. Should we start there? Yes. What does that mean? What does that look like? What does it mean to What does it mean to you as a per like personally, and also what it means to us professionally? I think it's the continually looking to get incremental wins, incremental changes over time, as opposed to looking to change things overnight. So it's the looking of small, manageable progress that you not only make but keep and how we do that for ourselves, but also teach other people how to do that for themselves and what that looks like in regards to their nutrition, their exercise, and their sleep. So it all depends on the person's starting point. So 1% better for us might look very different to 1% better for one of our clients because our starting points are different. We're both, you know, a good few years into health and fitness we do it it's part of our lifestyles so for us one percent better might look like i don't know adding a set in uh week to week to increase our volume if we're trying to grow our muscle tissue whereas for somebody who's just starting out if they've just come a, from a place of being completely sedentary their one percent better might be this week i'm going to do five thousand steps monday through friday it doesn't have to be these massive changes that are super unmanageable and also make people feel like they're unable to do the process. Mm, yeah, 100%. It's achievable. It's attainable. And there's almost no excuse not to try to strive to become 1% better in some facet of your life. I think like looking for those gains certainly in the gym is definitely doable. Can I do another 1% on the dumbbell, the bar? Uh, can I do another 1% on the repetitions within a set or even the set itself but yeah i think being able to assess your life and also it does kind of pull back from people trying to overhaul everything which is what we typically find people do right yeah they normally you'll normally find yourself in the position of wanting to change once you've hit a rock bottom of some description so for again for different people that's going to look different but people normally come to us when they've reached that mental point of saying i need to make a change now this isn't for everyone obviously we have clients who are trying to get to new levels and approaching new peaks but that isn't who we're talking about here so once people have got to that point where they're like "Fuck, i have to change something here the impetus, the sort of internal feeling of I have to change everything right now, mm -hmm. it's very well intentioned, but rarely leads to sustainable results. So you'll see that super often, especially with January coming up, is people will, after Christmas, where they've gone completely off the wagon, they've been drinking, they've been eating, they've been doing everything possible that is as completely non-adherent with a health and exercise journey that you could possibly be doing. And they're like, right, January, time to hire a coach. I'm gonna eat healthy every single day. And it's just too much of a drastic change, which is why you see those people who will get through January, they do their dry jam, they do their whatever, and it gets to the end of January, and then they start slipping back into those old habits. And it is a case of, if you took January to say, okay, over the past month, December, what have I been doing? I've been going out to socials every single week, multiple times a week. I've been drinking 10 plus units a week. I, my diet has been atrocious, like could not have been worse. How can I make that better? And it's a very simple answer. And the answer is, okay, if you took that 10 units of drinking to even five, you're still drinking, but we take that down to five. And instead of you going out three times a week, you go to out two times a week. And instead of getting a starter, a main, a dessert, and the drinks in with that, we could go, okay, we're gonna have the main and we're gonna have the dessert, but we're gonna go for a protein heavy main and we're gonna skip out on the unnecessary extras that come with it. So say if it's steak and chips or whatever, you just say, oh, can I have a side salad instead of the chips? There you've taken a bunch of things which in the moment are so inane that it might seem, why am I doing this? Like, mm. I'm barely changing anything. 
But once you've got that for a month, the next month you can say, okay, I'm going to take that five units down to none. And then I'm going to start meal prepping Monday through Friday, not Saturday, Sunday. You're still going to enjoy yourself a little bit. And then over the course of like four to five months, you've instituted sustainable behaviors that are now leading you to where you want to be, as opposed to trying to get all of the results that you wanted inside of one month and then sacking it off after that because you just can't stick to it. Yeah, that's the hard work as well that most people are trying to avoid. And it's easier in some cases for people just to jump on a diet that is actually even unsustainable for them to be able to stick to in the long term. It's it's crazy that actually being able to stick to a really shit diet, being able to adhere to that for like four weeks, eight weeks, that is actually easier than trying to just, you know, stick to something that is more sustainable and incremental because you don't get those easy wins. You've got to do it for four weeks, six weeks without seeing a huge amount of physical change. Because if you jump on a diet, like, you know, you're going to lose weight pretty quickly because there's something dramatic has happened. Yeah. If you you jump on keto post Christmas, you're going to lose about 12 kilos in the first three weeks. And you're going to be like, I am, I I am just going to lose 12 (laughs) kilos every three weeks forever. Crazy. Um, crazy. But that comes to an end because as soon as you go that one time that you break on that and you go, oh, I'm just going to have I've a completely couple of cookies. Everything over here. Yeah. and feel then, like a failure. And then you jump on the scale because you've been on your keto diet and you've just eaten a boatload of carbs and drank a load. And then you look at the scale and you're six kilos heavier and you're like, no. <laughs> no, it's over. I'm never going to make it happen. Especially when you've been sta- stepping on the scales and it's been such a linear drop because yes. you've jumped on this diet, because you've probably lost a ton of water. So you become accustomed to this like linear drop in the scales. Linear and super steep curve of progress. Like you've gone from up here and it's just gone ee- the Straight whole down. way down. Yeah, and then, yeah. you know, you, you do always get those guys who come out the gate super hot and they're so excited about it. You just have to say, let's let's just hold on. Yeah. Let's just hold on here and take this step by step by step. Because when those fluctuations do come, they have such disastrous mental effects on you. So when you've got to that point and then when you see that spike back up, it it becomes a catastrophe. And it becomes this thing where you're like, Oh, I've got to work like when it otherwise could have been, okay, we lost, you know, two kilos in January. Uh, I went out for a big meal. I came up by half a kilo. That's all right. Just another week, mm. another week, and I've totally got, recoverable. As yeah, well. totally easy to do. Um, I used to talk about this quite a lot. Is especially for bigger guys who, or not even just bigger guys, just people who have this kind of all or nothing mindset, which typically you will see in bigger guys, which I saw in myself initially, is because we have this impetus to go for things like. Um, Obviously, our drive to overconsume also applies to underconsume. Once you've set your mind on doing that, you're like, I'm going to do it. It's borderline uh, an addict's mindset. Is once you've set your mind on this thing, it's like, okay, I'm just doing this thing and I'm never going to do the other thing ever again. And then that is when you see these massive oscillations in like good and bad behavior. And then that sort of having its impact on your health and fitness journey. And the thing that I used to say less so now with these guys, because it's, it's a bit of a loose concept, but just trying to reduce those oscillation sizes. So if initially you've got this big spike down and then big spike up and then just over time trying to reduce those oscillations. Yeah. So when you're getting back on your diet, it doesn't look like I'm just eating chicken breast and lettuce this week. I'm doing intermittent fasting yeah. and three hours of cardio. It's every the gray day. area in between, isn't it? All yeah. There's so much area. You just want to get those oscillations down to the point where you're trending in the right direction you're still going up and down but you just don't have to deal with those feelings of being like i I am going to be david goggins to uh, i I am worthless within the space of a week Mm -hmm. and you know it's just not good for and it's trying to lean away from dieting based dieting led behaviors and actually trying to incorporate more health-based behaviors and habits into your lifestyle which so many people not necessarily avoid, but because people have been dieting for so many years, especially if you've got 
you know, you're trying to lose a fair amount of body fat. It's like, all with everything's so dieting based, dieting led. And it's actually, what can you do right now to become a healthier, better individual rather than thinking about like, how can I reduce my calories? How can I starve myself? What can I do here? What can I do there? Like cardio yourself into the ground to drop body fat. And none of that is sustainable. And people just burn out and feel like absolute shit doing it. Yeah, yeah. And it, it comes back to that intention thing of the sort of intention is good but the expectation is the hard bit about a health and fitness journey is how hard you go the hard bit about a health and fitness journey is the consistency it's doing the you know two percent better one percent better That's the hard over a massive mm. period of time is this sort of leads into another thing, which is why a reason why a, f a few people give up on this outside of not seeing the results that they want in, in regard to giving up on their health and fitness journey is that the sort of mundanity of the process is don't expect to come into this and it's going to be a hyper exciting thing where you're going to smash it and see like fantastic results. It's inherently mundane to be successful at this. It's a slow process over a big period of time. And then, you know, two to five years later, you look back and you go, fuck, I'm a different person. Like that, that's when you get to look back and be like, oh, wow. But it's not, a, you know, you can do a 12 week transformation. Great. Good luck holding on to that mm. after that. Yeah, like. yeah, yeah. It's not as impressive as doing a 12-month transformation. And that's what we want, right? We want people to find long-term solutions to whatever their problem might be, whether it's with their health, their weight, whatever it is, stick into something for 12 weeks. Most people can do that, man. Like, people can stick to really shit, unsustainable plans that suck the life out of them. People can do that for 12 weeks. That's yeah. actually quite impressive. What's more impressive is actually being able to stick to something for 12 months, but actually something that feels quite good. Something that after 12 weeks does become repetitive, does become boring. Like I would love to just sit there and probably smash 12 Krispy Kremes every single weekend and all the ice cream. And I know in the moment that would feel quite good, hmm. but like trying to lean away from that is quite boring. Like eating proper whole food, it's quite boring. It's, it's never as palatable. Boring. It's not that tasty, man. Yeah, it's that as well as, you know, I don't know. It's sort of, again, yeah, it's the mundanity of it. It's the 1% better as opposed to 50% better that gets people. Yeah. It's not, it's not it's, exciting. And we were talking about this recently, weren't we, about acquiring skills en route to becoming your yes, best. Yes, yes. Like discipline, a skill to be acquired, self-control, a skill to be acquired, leaning away from like super palatable food, a skill to be acquired. Yeah. Like your taste buds will literally need to change as you gravitate from eating too much chocolate, too many crisps. And it, and it requires a slow process of desensitization to those foods as well. Because as we said, if through the Christmas period, you know, you're completely overloaded with the sugar, fat, salt, whatever it is, if you go straight to all whole foods. Which is what people will be doing. It's gonna They're going to go straight from nothing. Christmas dinner, dude. Every single, what are the, the Ferrero Rocher packs? You know, when you get a big... Yeah a big pyramid of those bad boys with yeah. like 50 of them on. They're getting chinned, the, the box of heroes, they're Ch getting chinned. Chinning chinned. those, I, I grew up in a Scottish household. Chinning those was the equivalent to like setting fire to five grand. <laughs> my, my, my granny would be there and be like, each one of those things cost me one Oh man, pounds. I am so blessed, yeah. dude. My, we would go to Tesco's, we'd get the heroes, we'd get the Frere Rochers and they would be gone before like this even the prawn cocktail yeah you know, you're you're sitting there just waxing them off what was it and also the uh, the drinking aspect of it as well is crazy you don't realize how many you're putting yeah. away like super tasty drinks as well the baileys would be out so you've got this super rich super calorific food mm. and then people think it's a good idea to go on the first of jan just like Nothing. going from complete contrast it's like literally black and white isn't it yeah. all of this amazing stuff and then right i'm on a health kick Dry Jan, and I think Dry Jan has definitely got its merits. That can yeah. really change people's relationship with alcohol. And I actually massively recommend it. Yes. It's not yes. one of the all or, all or nothing things I do recommend, but having been 
I did dry jam a few years ago mm. uh, through those lockdowns and it massively changed my relationship with certainly my habitual drinking at home. Yes. And now I don't do any alcohol drinking at home. I just don't see the value or benefit. Mm. But I do recommend people explore that. Yes, exploring sobriety, um, we'll talk about in the realms of health, fitness and exercise because that's what we're qualified to talk about. But experimenting with sobriety and how it affects your behaviors towards your health and fitness journey is definitely something that I would suggest people to do, particularly people who are drinking multiple times a week. So it's not, it's less applicable to people who are like once a month, I just go out, get battered, and then that's that and move yeah, on the, because it's less problematic. Mm -hmm. yeah, but for the people who are like drinking throughout the week and then the next day, because your sleep is fucked, if you drink, that night of sleep is gone. Regardless of how many drinks you've had, uh, we know this from the data. If you drink, that night of sleep is now nil. It's redundant. So the next day, you're going to start leaning towards some bad food choices. And then those takeaways that evening start to become a little bit more appealing. And just taking that time of sobriety and then seeing how much more capable you are of following the process mm -hmm. than you were when you were drinking is a very, very interesting thing. Because drinking for a lot of people, me included, is this thing which sort of, it, it becomes this thing that allows you to veer from the path. It sort of creates that mental weakness the next day through the lack of sleep, through the lack of recovery, through the, you know, you may have had some not so good food on that night out or whatever it may have been. And just allowing your that time to see what your behavior is like without that. And then next time when you do go back to drinking, say if it is on a Thursday night, you're going to sit there and you're going to think and you're going to be like, if I have these drinks tonight, what are the odds that I'm going to wake up tomorrow and do my 10,000 steps? And like, you know, I've made good progress this week. I, I mean, I, I, I'm a kilo down from last week. Do I really need to, do I want to, you know, look What's at... What's more important as well, right? Yeah, and also a, a big thing, particularly for social drinkers, is social drinking doesn't go anywhere with age. Like... My mum is in her 60s. She still goes out socially drinking. It's not going anywhere. The experience of getting a bit wobbly with your mates and, you know, having a good time, it doesn't go. But y your body, your health and fitness, that has more of a ticking time on it. Like, it gets harder and harder and harder to achieve muscle growth, to achieve fat loss the older you get and the older that you've gotten without pursuing these things. So taking the time in your 20s, 30s, 40s, to build a more robust robust body and also build the ability to keep these habits as part of your lifestyle yeah. is super, super important because as you get older and also as those behaviors towards food and alcohol are more habitualized, exactly. as that time's gone on where yeah. you are the kind of person who I drink, you know, four times so a week. So it's just reinforcing a belief system over time. Yes. And actually a lot of people, well, a lot, especially with a lot of my guys or our guys is giving people options and like a lot of one option that people just do not think exists is like go to the pub, socialize with your mates and don't drink. Like, yeah. That is an option. I'm not yes. saying that's an easy option. Option one, Luke, what should I do? I'm out this weekend. Uh, how much have you drunk this week? I've drunk a couple of times. Option one, don't drink mate. Yeah. Like go to the pub and go alcohol free. There's I'm not also, saying it's an easy option, but it's one that people just do not think exists. There is also gray area within that. Um, to piggyback off your point as well, with the going to the pub sober thing, I found this a couple of years ago. I went sober for like, it was almost two years. I went completely to uh, teetotal. Were you like 13 and 14? No, <laughs> no. This was, I, I think it was 21 to 23 or an age that's like that. Cool yeah, age. That's cool, a real drink. Core cool age, ages where I was st stone cold sober. And I, I went to these events that I was going to previously because the, between, you know, 20 and 21, I was going out a fair bit, like going to festivals and stuff. And then I would go to the same events with the same people. And this isn't a detriment to them, but like I'd be there sober and I'd be like, I, I wasn't coming here to hang out with these people. I was coming here to get battered 
And that was sort of a key moment for me to realize like this is a, an unnecessary expense and an unnecessary detriment to my life. But back to the other point is there is gray area. So if you are going to the pub and the idea of going to the pub sober is borderline blasphemous to you, there is ways that you can have a more health and fitness orientated afternoon out to the pub. So a thing that I tell to my guys who drink a lot is pints. So drinking beer is like the most calorific drink that you can have. Have a vodka lime soda. And like limit the amount that you can have of those. So say I'm going to have three of them. Yeah. So you've dropped the calories down of that. Option three is have an al- have a have a have a pint and then have an alcohol free pint after that. Yes. There's obviously a lot less alcohol being drunk which means less hangover, which hopefully improves your sleep just a bit more, a bit more get up and go that next morning and a massive reduction in calories. I think a Guinness alcohol free is half the calories of a pint of Guinness. So you could go pint of Guinness, alcohol free, pint of Guinness, alcohol like pint of Guinness. That's another option. It also helps offset the social pressure that you might get. So like going to the pub and having no drink in hand immediately causes the people around you to notice and say something about it. This is something that I found when I was going out sober is that if I didn't have a drink in my hand, people would be like, oh, are you not drinking? And then it starts the questions and then it just becomes this laborious thing of people like, oh, why are you not drinking? It's um, Chris Williamson has got a good quote about this is alcohol is the only drug that if you don't take it, the people around you think there's something wrong with you. So going to the pub and not having a drink in your hand, people are like, what? Like, what are you doing? Mm. Whereas if you have a, that alcohol-free pint in your hand, nobody's going to ask any questions. They're too involved in the social situation. And they're not, you know, going to dip their finger in it and be like, alcohol-free pint, blasphemous, g- get a drink down you. But if you, like, get your drink yourself and you park it, you nurse it, nobody asks any questions. And that's good option to get four, it. just yeah. reducing overall volume of how much you Well, no, I meant with the alcohol-free mm-hmm. one is that if yeah. you have that sit there, park it, and then it sort of reduces the social pressure that yeah. comes with these like pub trips, particularly for guys who work in a corporate setting. Maybe it's drinks out with a client or yeah. whatever, and it is an important part of their work because that's how they build their relationships, but that can help offset that. And you still have the drinking atmosphere, and also, if you become a bit more animated, nobody knows that you haven't been drinking. That, Like, again, they're not going to taste your drink. So you can still do all of those things without the calorie consumption and yeah, the next day yeah, and then yeah. the hangover. If you're, I mean, certainly if you're someone that drinks, can chin six, seven, eight pints. Yeah. I mean, I'm hammered after a two, two pints. I'm really feeling yeah. that. Dude, yeah. I'm actually, so I am bringing back shandies. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is outrageous. I know I have started drinking shandies. Yeah. I think the last time I used to drink shandies was in the rugby club, probably at like 16, 17, nice, just nice. one after the game. And yeah. then shandies 18. And then you obviously, you, you, you don't touch a shandy again until now. Yeah. Uh, so I'm bringing back shandies in a big, big way. Firstly, they taste absolutely glorious. <laughs> it's a shame you can't get diet lemonade with them. That would really save the calories and probably still taste as good. And mm. you don't get anywhere near as hammered. And you can drink like three or four of them and they don't even touch the sides. I've, I've done a few nights on shandies. I don't drink that much, but my mates have been on the pints, got hammered, and I've had like three, four shandies and I'm, I'm, I'm feeling great, laughing at them, living my best life. So, dude... Message, message for the people. Shandies, shandies is shandies, for life. Shandies, shandies, option five. Shandies, <laughs> shandies are making a comeback. Um, yeah, alcohol is a real tough one. I find a lot, especially with with my guys, especially if you've got like the career driven individuals, partners at firms, and like you said, like the socialising aspect mm. of business meetings is uh, very alcohol orientated. There is a lot of peer pressure that is going to come with that. And, you know, what are the options that people potentially have to help navigate that if they're on a journey of becoming healthier, uh, better, uh, want to get leaner? That's yeah. tough, man. It's, yeah, there's option one, alcohol-free. Option two, lower caloric alcohol beverages like yeah. spirits, gins, vodkas with spritzers. Lower uh, amount. Set yourself a drink limit and exactly. stick, to, it. stick and to your gun. <clears throat> stick, just drink to less, drink to less. And that is in essence like a really nice definition of be, being and becoming more disciplined, saying you're going to do something and following through with it. Yeah. If you constantly set yourself targets like I'm going to eat one course, I'm going to drink this amount and you don't do it, 
like your, your, your words just become more meaningless. Yeah. You just never end up. You're not building that stack of proof that you are who you say you are. And this is why having a coach is awesome. Yes. Because we will ask our clients questions. I've got loads of clients right now I'm working with who are trying to navigate a more social calendar as we get into certainly December. It's like, what are we going to do tonight? Uh, this is what I'm going to have. This is how much I'm going to drink. This is what I'm going to eat. Great. Stick to that mm. and message me after once it's done, yeah. like how it went, went good. This is what I did. Great. Amazing. Once you get that feeling of like value, it feels good. It feels repeatable. Yeah. Then it's uh, like, again, it's just acquiring that skill of, of saying you're going to do something and stick to it regardless yeah. of the peer pressure, regardless of the environment. Yeah. And, and it feels good. It feels good to be able to say no to nice things. Yeah. Like it feels good to sit there and be like, oh, I'm just going to have a cup. Nothing feels yeah. better than making progress. Self-control feels good. Discipline feels good. You you can see why people do get a touch high and mighty in the initial stages of a successful health and fitness. And journey. dude, if someone doesn't want to make the compromise with alcohol, like they're making the compromise elsewhere in their journey of fat loss, yes. which is food. Yeah. And most people don't want to compromise on overall caloric intake, especially when we're looking at food. Mm. It's, it's it's like what's the trade off here? Like yeah. you want to drop body fat, you want to make choices, you want to adopt habits that are healthy but do align with that. Like alcohol is an easy win. And we, we're not talking about like, like we're not boring here. We're not talking about locking the key and drinking nothing and going teetotal. It's like, but there's some compromise that can be made. And if you don't want to make that compromise with alcohol, it's coming from somewhere else. And most people also are, aren't willing to do that. We want people eating as much food as possible and mm. dropping body fat, right? Yeah. I don't know how healthy I would describe uh, gearing your week to make a caloric, you know, calorically... Um, sensical night out on the beers so it's like upping your step count to fifteen thousand, dropping calories down so you can have as many pints as possible no that's gonna lead <laughs> that, yeah that, that again that's so that, that that's a big isn't it you'll see loads of coaches will be like banking calories but like don't bank calories you, like, you, don't, you don't you, even need that mindset you, you can do it you can do it and we may or may not know a man who has successfully lost quite a lot of body fat doing that um but I don't. I'm not a believer in banking calories. Just, just have your on plan. Have your fat loss days that you you know what that day looks like in terms of like a nutritional framework. You eat lots of good whole food. Like if you just eat predominantly, like good healthy whole food. Yeah. Like you can you can your your bank the calories required simply because like it's quite challenging to eat in a surplus of calories that are foods that are more whole, more healthy, right? You yeah. can definitely do it. I'm not saying you can't do it. It's doable. It's significantly more difficult. Yeah. Um, yeah. A, from a just palatability standpoint, it's like chicken and rice. It's not that entertaining after you've had your fill. Whereas ultra processed foods, like you can just keep on going. So tasty. So, so tasty. So tasty. Stay away from the aisles in the middle of the supermarket and stay away from anything that has a yellow sticker on <laughs> anything that comes in packs of five i like just just run run as far yeah the multi-pack thing can. kills me. well you know supermarkets have brought the thing in now where they cannot display any of that on entrances entrances to supermarkets just because obviously it was just doing people over yeah. and uh the same at queues like you know when you're queuing up yeah. at till or the self-serve stuff yeah. they're not supposed to have any of that shit bar. yeah it's all like chewing gum now it's terrible or, or maybe <laughs> your naked bar Oh, naked bars oh, yeah they're okay I, I don't okay. I can't get on board with naked bars it's We're, like baby food dude with all of this in mind um, we've been talking about um, I mean the, a really relevant topic to talk about is Christmas yes. uh, the carnage that is December we've been prepping our clients to try to think about I mean if you've got if we have clients right now that are trying to drop body fat yeah. like they've got realistically from the point of this recording four to five weeks to continue dropping body fat. And then we'll be moving most of our guys into maintenance for a couple of weeks over December because we've had enough skin in the game to know that there is going to be a two week period in December yeah. where dropping body fat is just not feasible. And yeah. We don't want people feeling that pressure to try to do that either. So we've got a period of time now that's dropped body fat between now and when December really kicks off, which is like the 15th when the personal, I don't know, the friend socials, work yeah. socials kick off. And then you've got January, which is one hell of a conducive month to start kicking on with more fat loss. So um, with that in mind, what do you think and how do you think people should be approaching a December with regards to dropping body fat, maintenance, continuing healthy habits? What are your thoughts? 
in regards to what they're currently doing, it depends again. It, it depends on where you are. Um, Always, yeah. se setting yourself up for <laughs> success, wise. <clears throat> generally speaking, this is this is actually a somewhat it's, brain tickling. It's question. a hard question. I mean, what. I'll always think about like momentum and a continuation, certainly with exercise and activity. Yes. First and foremost, if we want people to become consistent exercisers, because physically, mentally, we know they're going to feel their best. It's going to improve the length of their life, their health span, blah, book, blah, blah. Book blah. your training sessions in the, mm. this is something that we do with all of our online coaching clients, but booking your training sessions in beforehand. So on the Sunday when you're scheduling your week or whatever day you schedule your week, Scheduling out when you're going to be doing your exercise sessions is super important because then it's part of your calendar and it's not a negotiable on the day where it's like, yeah, I'm at work. I could go to the gym today, got time. If it's in your calendar, it's in your calendar. It's going to get done. <clears throat> so A, scheduling that out is probably a good idea. B, with the social events, sometimes putting a exercise session the next day early in the morning is going to help you enforce better habits on the night of. So if you know yeah, you've got that so. exercise session in the morning afterwards, A, on the night out, it's going to make you a little bit more cognizant of the decisions that you're making. So like maybe five pints becomes two. Maybe you reduce the intake of food that you're going to be having on that. Also, on the next day, it sets you up for success. So after a night out, um, having something in the morning where you can get a super easy win sets the pace for that day and means that you've got positive momentum going forward. So say on the Friday night, you've gone out, blah, 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 whatever. You get up the next day. It could be something super simple. Maybe it's, I'm going to stretch out. I'm going to do a stretching session in the morning. Once you've done that, you're like, okay, I've done something. Mm, maybe I can go for a walk. I'll walk to the shops. Once you've walked to the shops, maybe it can be like, okay, I'm going to meal prep for the next few days to make sure that I have X amount of meals, which are excuse free, which means they're already in your fridge. All you have to do is grab them, microwave and bring them to work, whatever it may be. You've then built a good whack of positive momentum off the back of that by just putting one good thing in the next day. And it doesn't even have to lead to that, but it can help lead to that. Also, what you can do is use uh, like previous Christmases and this season of December as evidence. Mm. So if we talk a lot about like what people could and should do a little bit more of, it's also like looking at last December, the December before and before, it's pretty repeatable. Family, friends, Christmas Day. You've got, you know, if you've got an individual that actually typically will gain two, three, four, five kilos over a December period, which is not hard for a lot of people to do, um, what you can do is just think about, well, what could I do actually a lot less of to create a more conducive environment mm. for me not to gain six kilos? But what I could do is just gain two because a lot of that's going to be water retention and hell, that's so much more progress. Yeah. I mean, that's so... And that's the 1% better mindset is we're not... You're not going into Christmas being like, all right, by Christmas, I'm going to be down four kilos. And that's the January mindset as well, man, because a lot of people will binge their way through Christmas because mm. they're telling themselves that they're going to start a diet on, on January. And that alone, <laughs> most people can't stick to that for too yeah. long. So they end up eating, drinking, not moving, not exercising, because they're telling themselves they're going to start something on January the 1st. Yeah. And then just obviously gain unnecessary weight because of this mindset of, oh, I'm going to start this diet on XYZ day. Mm. Can't stick to that. Lose a little bit of that weight back, but they're net up like three or four kilos because yeah. they haven't been able to stay consistent with whatever changes they wanted to implement. Yeah. So if you're listening to this now, start instituting positive behaviors now, right now. Yeah. As of hearing this right now, after listening to this, what's the first thing you can do? It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be the hardest thing in the world. If you start now, you're doing it. You've taken your first step. And don't take your foot off the gas. Like, yeah. Don't, don't become inactive. Don't tell yourself you're going to be lazy. Like continue moving your bloody legs and valuing those small things. Like just be active, Cons like continue exercising consistently. It, you don't need to be hammering it. Yeah. Like just get in the gym once, twice, three times. That's going to help you feel mentally better. 
And we talk a lot about how cardio isn't the best tool for fat loss. No. When actually it's it's like a lot of things all in one, isn't it? It's, it is the running, it is the cardio, it is the steps, it is the movement, it is the sleep, it is nutrition. Like fat loss isn't just any one thing. It's a, it's, it's a bunch of things. Yeah. Nutrition. It's an incredibly simple process with a lot of moving parts is what I'd say. Mm. It's like, yes, it's eat less, move more, but what's instituted in that can be you know, hundreds of things if you want it to be. Mm. And it can also be way simpler. But anyway, the point being is that just carry on with what's manageable. Take the little wins, even if you're not making loads of progress. Are you, the way to look at it is, are you doing better than you were doing last Christmas? If so, win. That's it. Amen, mate. That is an absolutely banging statement to finish on. Um, dude, with... Talking about like Christmas and January, fad diets, fad ma- diets. mainstream diets. Um, what what do they have in common? Um, what do people need to? What do people do you think need to be looking out for with this kind of stuff? So fad diets. What do they have in common? So the main reason fad diets become popular is because of the results that large amounts of people get from them. So I think thing one is understanding mechanistically what's going on and why are people getting these results. And it's the same in any diet. And that's you've elicited a calorie deficit. So you are eating less energy than you were beforehand. Different diets do this through different means. Intermittent fasting, you just reduce the window in which you are eating, which means you are less likely, it's not even guaranteed, you are less likely to be consuming more calories than you're burning. Um, Other diets manipulate other things. So keto, as we said, is going to cause you to drop a bunch of water weight. You look a lot drier. You see the results people get from keto, and it's a real big visual difference because the human body does hold a lot of water once you drop that out. The scale number is very, very different, and you're going to look very, very different. Another big part of fad diets is the community people build around it, which is another thing which is quite hard to get out of other diets is having this big group of people, particularly online, Mm. who are going through the same process as you. And it allows you to have that support network, which is a really good thing. This isn't me pushing fad diets and saying that they are better than just tracking your calories. Because whatever you do to elicit enough fat loss to get you in a healthy range, more power to you. I'm not uh, emotionally invested in that. But that can be a good determining factor in success is, do you have people around you who are going through the same process? And those fad diets do help people have this like camp where it's like, we're the keto guys. Like we, we got stuff figured out. Um, yeah, so they, they have a lot of success, um, a through the amount of people that they get involved in them and also the belief. So the reason why any diet is successful is because you stick to it. The adherence is the thing which determines whether or not a diet is successful. Again, there's lots of different diets. I'm not going to bash on any of them too much, but the adherence is the key determining factor in success and adherence over time. And people's belief in those diets really helps drive that. So that is another sort of point to consider is even if you're not doing one of these diets, say you're hiring a coach is believing in the process can hold a lot of power because if you're half hearted in going into it and you're like, Oh, I'm not, I'm not really, this isn't, you know, if you hire a coach, Do what your coach tells you to do with the best of your ability. And then if it doesn't work, the only person to blame is the coach. So believing in the process is also another big part. Yeah. All, all part, all, all fad diets, all paths lead to the same destination. Um, Gastric sleeve, keto, like they all create an energy deficit, right? Yeah. And it's just about trying to figure out and find a diet that actually just feels quite good. Yeah. And people probably think we're quite militant with our diet, but like I had an absolute savage weekend. I went out Friday night with my missus, beautiful meal. I went out Saturday night for dinner. We went to the cinema. We got some popcorn. She ate none of it. So I chinned that whole bag. Mm. Sunday, parents came into town, went out for pancakes. My mum bought four scones, of which I had three. Mm. And... 
I weighed myself on the Friday. I wasn't going to step on the scale mm. on Monday, but I stepped on the scale 2.5 kilos heavier than Friday. Mm. 2.5. Oh no, disaster. I know. A bunch of water weight. Carnage, carnage. Mm. And I almost didn't step on, but I thought, I mean, if, if we are going to walk the walk with this kind of stuff, you, man, yeah, like, yeah. I felt like I was, I was like lying to myself and my clients if I didn't do this. Yeah. Stepped on it and I actually just kind of laughed. I was like 2.5. Got back on track with my diet, my just way of eating that feels best and good for me. Dropped one kilo in 24 hours and then I weighed myself again today and I'm like almost down again. So yeah. the water retention is carnage. But also like scale weight moves for a reason. It's like I was, I, you just got to kind of front up to it. Like my weight went up for a reason. I went yeah. a little, I had a bit too much fun at the weekend, but I had a great weekend. Yeah. But, and I didn't continue that. I don't continue eating pancakes and scones going into You didn't Monday, completely Tuesday. drop off. And also the accountability mm. side of things of stepping on the scale after you've had these weekends off is a big part of it. Yeah, it's a... Because it's, a, it's hard. And it, it's hard to do. Stepping on the scale after you know you've fucked it up and you've fucked it up big time. Yeah. Like, as Luke said, like, I, I do the exact same thing as well sometimes. Like, I'll have weekends where it's like, I have completely shagged this. <laughs> Um, stepping on the scale and just being like, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a reason why. The there's a, always that. a reason why it goes f shooting up. And it's like you can berate yourself about it or you can just be a slightly more accountable person to you. Like to myself, no one else. So, okay, this has gone up. This was interesting. I was actually more... <laughs> I was actually more... That's not, I mean, just looking at the scale like, hmm, yes. Sc <laughs> scones. This is this is interesting. Well, I've, I've, ch I've chinned a lot this weekend, mm. but like the worst thing I'm going to do, I'm not going to continue on this pattern and trajectory because this is just not going to feel good. And we say that to all of our clients. Yes. Just and respond positively. Don't yes. be a dick to yourself. Yes. It's gone up for a reason. Don't beat Respond. yourself up too much. I, I had somebody ask me this, um, mm -hmm. qu that question in real life the other day, actually, is people assume because we're coaches, like we live these incredibly monk-like existences where, you know, we never go out for meals. We never, like, we never go off the path. Uh, one of my friends, he, he was, uh, he's from jujitsu. He was like, do you ever just crash out and eat everything? And I was like, yeah. And Friday to Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, like not even Friday to Sunday, but like, say for you at the moment, back to the 1% better thing. If your diet at the moment is you get to Friday and, you know, it's weapons-free, fucking everything is going in. The next step for you is to make it Friday and Saturday. It's not to say, I'm never doing this again, because it comes back to that sort of all-or-nothing mindset, which in the moment feels like you're doing the right thing, but is actually a lack of discipline. Mm. All-or-nothing is a lack of discipline because it means you're not willing to make it slightly better for the longevity yeah. of the journey. And priorities, man. I actually, I, I like, I, I wanted that from that weekend. Like, I wanted to eat more. I wanted to consume more tasty food. I wanted to go out and eat as well. But the yeah. context is everything. Like, I'm moving out of London in a couple of weeks. Like, I want to be enjoying it. And yeah. I know I have the, I don't want to say I have the resilience, but I know what's going to happen and I can expect that scale weight fluctuation. Like usually I wouldn't step on the scale on Monday. Yeah. I just get back onto my normal eating and I know by the middle of the week, it's just going to like the, the outcome will just take care of itself. Anyway, I'll be back to where I need to be. Yeah. But I thought I'd see how much of a, how much damage I could do over a Friday to Sunday period and 2.5 kilos were decent. I'm actually quite impressed. I'm, you know, I'd like to try and see how much more damage I can do this weekend, but <laughs> I'm definitely not going to do it. Please and don't do that, client. Going, <laughs> uh, going back to exactly what you just said, this weekend is way less social for me. Like, I'm not going to have a ton of meals out. I'm not going to be consuming as any anywhere near the amount of calories I just did this weekend because I'm just eating out less. Yeah. So it's just going to be just just more conducive to not seeing a big uh, scale weight fluctuation. But that's a key. That's a key reason why a lot of people give up on their diet. Yeah. And also a key thing is you didn't allow that negative momentum to carry on, but you also didn't overcompensate and you didn't drop your calories by 700 for this week because you're panicking about it and you need to lose this weight for like some inexplicable reason. And you just need to see that number again. Um, just why yeah. is my answer. Like, but that, that what? Is one why? healthy plan. A healthy plan, like eat and drink everything in sight Friday to Sunday and then starve yourself Friday 
Monday through to Thursday through Friday. Fantastic that, I plan. Mean, Great plan. Real great. big fluctuations. Real good for the mental yeah. health side. Again, that's kind of like the all or nothing stuff as well, isn't it? Yeah. Like, and we're trying to get people to... Pe we've had so many guys, so many girls come to us who are all or nothing. It's like, guys, there is some awesome stuff in between. Like, yeah. Let's get into that gray area. Let's dance around in there and see what's in there. Like, you don't have to go off, off rails Friday through to Sunday. Yeah. You can probably go off rails one day, and that's totally recoverable. Yes. Have your off-plan meals and enjoy them and be accountable to that, but get back on track and recover. Yeah, and it, it, it comes back to that thing of getting into the best shape of your life is a person you're trying to become, not an outcome you're trying to achieve. You know, a lot of the fitness industry is based off or it sort of trickles down from bodybuilding side of things. They're the most popular people in the industry because they are in the best shape. Now, there's a bunch of reasons for that. But what also comes with that is that they have to get into the best shape of their life on a very particular day. They have to look as good as humanly possible on a particular day. You don't. If you want to get into the best shape of your life and stay that way for the foreseeable future, there's going to be ups and downs and you don't need to overcompensate. It just becomes part of the journey. Just go take stock of what happened and how it happened. So in your case, it was a social weekend and you overcooked it. Like there's not much more to it than that. Unless, you know, there's something happened which made you start reaching for the scones, but you're shaking up. No, there was nothing. So you, you just get back to the path and then you will get to the point when you get to the point. But then it becomes a case of like, okay, that's happened now and that's taken you back, let's say a week, that's taken you back a week's worth of progress. What can you do this week to make sure that you're not losing an entire week's worth of progress this week? So uh, say your mum's coming to visit again. You have two scones. You have two of the pancakes instead of three. You've just dropped the calories down. You've just reduced the damage done. And now the path is trending back towards where you need to go. But you haven't turned into this sort of monk-like bodybuilder. Yeah, I mean, not every And they weekend. don't even stick yeah, to their not, diets. Not every weekend yeah. looks like that. It's like when you wake up in the morning... You leave your front door to get into your car. You've got a flat tire. That was my weekend. Like I don't, I don't go around and give myself like three punches on the other tires and write off the entire week, right? I'm yeah. like, okay, fuck, I've got a flat tire here. What can I do to fix this? That is that Monday. That is that spike in scale way. Taking responsibility for it, it happens. But just get back on track. You don't go and slash the other three tires just because yeah. you've fucking blown a weekend. Yeah, you can't. You can't throw everything away. But that's again, that is like a mindset. That's why this is so much less about move more, eat less. It's so much more kind of the, the transformations always happen between the ears first. Like unless you go through that big transformation in the way you think, how you speak to yourself, like your mindset has to change. Yeah. If you're going to go through that. Like, like we talk loads about it being identity change, right? Yeah. Like you are still the same awesome individual you well, when you started this diet, except now you just think differently, you speak to yourself differently, you have an accumulation of good and bad habits, but you have ones that are just more conducive to a healthier, better version of you. Mm. Um, it's cool, it's cool. Yeah, scale weight is a big reason why people uh, struggle with their diets. Um, boredom, we've talked a bit about um, diets that kind of cut all the joy out of your life, which are kind of the mainstream the side of things. diets. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, even, yeah, the unsustainability with that, it's like, you can't blame people that struggle with mainstream diets if you can't stick to it. Like that's, yeah. that's going to be tough. Long-term adherence is always the key, like indicator of a any form of success in anything, yeah. like regardless of diet, health, nutrition, exercise. Adherence. Like if you, you are learning a skill. Can you learn to play the piano to a high degree over the course of a weekend? No. In the exact same way, you can't become a health and a healthy and fit person over the course of a weekend. In the same way that you can't become morbidly obese and completely unhealthy over the spe uh, space of a weekend. These things take time. And it takes time of putting practice into this becomes the thing that you do. So viewing these decisions as like little wins, little votes in boxes of this is the type of person you're trying to become as opposed to I have to do this to mm. achieve X, Y, or Z. Yeah, and this is why actually all of this stuff is a really important part of fat loss, actually having these failures, like having a big weekend, 
going off going off track going off plan even if you didn't plan to do that like having unexpected things come up in your calendar and uh, how you and, respond yeah to exactly them. man it's such an important part of fat loss and even being able to find a sustainable plan you can adhere to which again the plan being the life that you want to live like you need to see the scale weight fluctuate you need yeah. to respond positively you need to go off plan at the weekends you need to respond positively you need to have socials you need to navigate a christmas you need to navigate holidays like if you avoid all of that stuff you lose weight and as soon as a spanner gets thrown in the works you're fucked like as soon as something gets in the way of your normal schedule that you need to do to achieve the result that you're trying to achieve, you feel like it's over. Exactly. Like, Injuries, COVID, traumatic experiences, relationships, uh, busy periods of work, anything that's going to disrupt someone's pattern. Like mm. we need all of that. Like yeah. when my, oh, dude, when my clients message me and they're like, I'm ill, I'm like, great. Let's, let's see, let's see, good. How, good. Let's see how we good. navigate this. Obviously, I don't yeah. want anyone to be unwell. I love you guys so much. But um, good. Love my friends, my family, my clients. You're ill? Uh, the... Good. Time to find <laughs> yeah. out what you can do when you are Are Ill. you ready? David Goggins, you're ill. Show me what you've got. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> no, it is true. Obviously, don't want to wish that stuff on people, but it does, again, it's, it's like you say, it's just adding another string to the bow. It's like becoming a more resilient version of you. Yes. And not the number one reason why people don't get to where they want they quit mm. like navigate the challenging weeks like we don't want to see people when they're firing on all cylinders we want to see them when they're in the trenches and they're struggling yes because if they can navigate through that shit they're going to come out of the back of it a completely different person yes and also finding finding the wins the silver lining mindset or the good jocko mindset of like okay you're injured good what can you <laughs> yeah, what love can, that video. what can you do in that situation to continue making the progress that you can do can you walk good you can get your steps right. in it's the same thing as like okay this weekend you had too many drinks and you completely went off your diet and now you're 3 kilos heavier good we now understand the behaviors that lead to you falling off your diet yeah. you can now do something about it yeah. the map is now set you you have a better idea of what's going on like that mindset, watching that video is, you know, it does quite a lot for me, maybe because I'm a 20 something year old boy and, you know, Jocko gets me fired up. But whenever I feel like shit is not going well, whether it be like diet, business, whatever it may be, something that is not going great in my life, I stick that video straight on and I'm like, one. okay, is there something that I can do in this situation to make it better? And then you start looking for the controllables. The first thing to do when stuff goes wrong is start looking for the controllables. Once you've identified them, start taking them off. So it's like, okay, you've gained a bit of weight over the weekend. What's the first thing you can do? Get your steps in. What's the second thing you can do? Meal prep. What's or, or not even meal prep, because that can be a quite overwhelming for people to think that they've got, especially if you've got like a busy mum or dad with three kids screaming at yeah. them. Like, don't even worry about meal, meal prepping. Just have your next meal, just make it relatively healthy. Yeah. Like, just focus on that next meal. Focus on that next like one to 2,000 steps more you can get than you yeah. did yesterday. Yesterday was terrible. Like, your, your breakfast was good. You've made progress. Exactly. Well I love that. Yeah. It's like, Luke, I'm working 13 hours a day. I'm sleeping like shit and I don't feel very well. Like, great. Let's crack on. We're going to find a way. Yeah. This is this is what this is why people reach out <laughs> for coaching. Like, is there anything you can do about that as of right now? Yeah. No. Okay. What can you do? Yeah. Let's crack on. Let's find a way. Yeah. And that's what I love most about our jobs is help. We don't we don't help people when they're fine on all cylinders. Like we mm. just all we do is celebrate their wins, and that's what we that's what I love most about this. Waking up to messages and like Luke, this has happened. This is a hit PB with my five k. Amazing. We're just waiting for those weeks. Yeah, we can feel them like going a bit, <laughs> going a bit quiet. Hey, we haven't heard from you this week. No check in. Like, what's going on? I'm there's really struggling. Qu there's cortisol coming yeah. through my phone. This is this yeah. crack on. This is this yeah. is what we're here for. This is yeah. when the work starts. I don't, like when you start a pro coaching program, you're motivated at the start. Yeah, I want to see you in twelve weeks. Yeah, I want to see what you're made. What of. Do, what do you look like after you've been ignoring me for a week and sacking off your diet? Can you come back and can you get back on the horse? 
that is the real testament. That will show you whether or not this is something you can do. We've had some awesome trans awesome transformations from people that have gone off grid for like two, three weeks because oh. of a real solid reason yeah. in their family, their personal life. Even, get that even outside of that, like, you know, I've had guys like completely fuck it and they'll come back and get back on the horse and continue pushing it. Yeah. yeah. And that is what separate, that's always what will separate them from the version that doesn't get the results that they want. Yeah. Being able to come back, even if it's two, three, four weeks, like making that comeback and doing it again. It's never over. Again and again. Like, it's never over. If you want it, it's never over. Yeah. Awesome. We've got a couple more questions on managing cravings, ultra processed foods. Are they making people fat? So we start with that one because I guess that's ultra a little bit more food. kind of current. Um, what are ultra processed foods and are they making you fat? So ultra processed foods are actually quite clearly defined. I was uh, researching this the other day. So it's any food or food product which is primarily constituted of ingredients which are either synthesized from whole foods or extracted from whole food products and laboratory chemicals so like emulsifiers stabilizers stuff like that so that is the is a clearly defined thing but people use the term much more liberally which i think in some settings is okay but it, it sort of goes out to anything which doesn't like when you look at it you can't immediately identify what part of nature it came from is the easiest way of defining it for the layman is like you know a, a packet of party rings can you point to me the party oh, ring they tree? Are a classic. can you point to me the party ring tree no no you cannot um ultra processed foods are not making you fat or they might be so the answer to this question, as with anything health and fitness, is it depends. The problem with ultra-processed foods isn't, you know, that they are magically making you fat. In a calorie-controlled environment, if you are eating 6,000 calories of party rings and Fanta, you're going to get just as fat as you would be consuming quinoa and lettuce. Now, Granted, eating 6,000 calories of quinoa and lettuce would be a much more impressive task. It's much, much harder to do. The problem is, is how easy it is to overconsume, and that is why it is making you fat. Because when you consume those foods, you're not having the serving size of party rings, which is two for 100 calories or whatever it may be. You're nailing the entire sleeve. That is more so the issue there. So I, I'm always reticent to demonize foods, A, because I don't think it's particularly healthy way to view nutrition and it sort of lends itself to that all or nothing mindset. It's like, oh, I don't eat that crap. It's like, all right, well done. You got the I don't eat crap award. Are you making the progress that you want to be making? If the answer is still no, because you can still be eating really, really healthily all whole foods and still be overweight and you don't want to be. So... If you then included, you know, four or five party rings per week or whatever it is to that diet and it made it more enjoyable for you to restrict your calories elsewhere and then you saw a successful fat loss journey as a byproduct of that, then you're winning. But no, uh, ultra processed foods aren't making you inherently fat, but they are much easier to over consume. So finding their place in your diet, whether that be a moderate amount of them, none of them, or potentially for some people you know there's those guys who've done those diets where it's they just mcdonald's for 60 days but they account for the calories and they still lose the weight that they were trying to lose so whatever amount of it fits into your diet and allows you to create a sustainable uh, nutrition plan for yourself that doesn't leave you feeling like crap because obviously if you're surviving off party rings you're not going to be feeling fantastic yeah. that is the other part of it is <clears throat> ultra processed foods tend to be less micronutrient and uh mineral dense than whole foods are because that's not a primary concern of the research and development lab putting together party rings they're not like oh shall we put them 300 milligrams of magnesium <laughs> you know uh, that's not their concern their concern is to create 
a, a food that you will eat a lot of and therefore buy more of. That is their primary concern, and that's something to think about when you are purchasing those foods. Yeah, moderation is a tough word to define, and that's very individual. And also, all yeah, I mean, all roads lead to like calories. Uh, yeah, that's really basic. And what I say to everyone is, we're we're basically going on a journey here to find a form of dietary restriction that feels least restrictive for you. Yes. My mindset has yes, yes. massively changed on that. Like yeah. I would never use the word restriction, but I use it so much more now than I ever have before. Yeah. I thought there were some negative connotations to that, but actually like you, like we do need to find a form of restriction because of food availability, because of the ultra processed foods that are super, super palatable. If you don't place some form of restriction, there's gonna be something that happens as a result of that. And people do gain body fat as, as a result slowly over time. And that leads to negative health outcomes. So yeah. Finding a form of dietary restriction that feels least restrictive to the individual is what we help people with, and a form of restriction that feels good. And that place is bloody hard to find, Yeah, but it can be found with some work, with some failure, with some successes, and with some wins. But finding that nutritional pattern and that nutritional framework, like we know what works for us, dude, right? Mm. Like I know Monday to Friday, I am tight. Like it is good. It feels mm. good. I can stick to it. And then I don't blow it all out at the weekend, but I do have some indulgences. Yeah. Uh, but I pick and choose my indulgences really well. I enjoy them because I have them a little bit less. And I know that if I'm having something that, you know, like a sweet thing or an indulgence every single day, that's not a sweet treat or an indulgence. That's just a bad habit that I've picked up. Yeah. It's I've gone through little phases of that. I'm not so bad at it. I do try to just eat whole food throughout the week, but like, you know, the protein puddings and the protein yogurts, it's easy to get into the habit of having those each night. And that's not bad. Yeah. That's personally just not what works for I, me. I've gotten much better at moderating and including more palatable foods in my diet. And it has taken me years and years and years and years, which comes back to the point where it's like, when I started my journey, it was whole foods, every single meal, everything's accounted for, tick, 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 tick. And as soon as I come off the path, it's, you know, everything's out the window. Whereas like now I'll include like, I have a yogurt bowl every night. It's my last meal. Same. For the, yeah, yeah. So it's banging. Funny. Yeah, it's so bang. But like, say if on top of that, you know, I'll have like one brownie that's like put on there and calorie accounted for, I'm better and better at just being like, okay, that is that. And not being like, okay, I've had one brownie. Yeah. Now loaf of bread. Yeah. 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 Or <laughs> have the brownie. Just don't eat 50 of them this week and you're probably going to be okay. You'll be fine. Yeah. Dude, should we conclude episode two? Conclude episode two. That is bang on one hour, which is all That's we've good. got today. Um, what do you think, mate? I think we're doing good. I think we're providing value to the people. I think we got at least 50 plus views on the last one. And I thought my performance on the last one was terrible. I'm looking forward to watching this one back and just seeing there's got to be at least a 1% improvement. So I'm excited. Yeah, I'm... <sighs> it's hard being in front of a cameraman and doing this. Articulate. I, I felt like I do a lot of stuttering and filler words. Yes. I... And my articulacy on camera is improving by the moment. Yeah, I think... Right, dude, let's conclude there. Let's not chat any more shit. Episode two. 1% better. Locked and loaded. Good. Cheers, guys. Thanks for listening. Peace out.